Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is David Gallagher and uh, I'm the CEO of the Centre for International Finance and Regulation. Uh, welcome to our event, welcome to our dinner. Uh, tonight is to celebrate, uh, among other things, uh, the contributions to scholarship of two eminent scholars. Um, and uh, we've got them as keynote speakers tomorrow, um, Larry Gloston and Pete Kyle. Um, 30 years ago, Back to the Future, I said earlier today, Back to the Future was 30 years ago. Um, Time Machine was the Delor DeLorean. Um, I don't know where you were 30 years ago, but certainly these scholars have, have really pioneered the area of market microstructure. And certainly as we know it over the last 30 years, the uh, pace and change, the technology, uh, the regulation and design of securities markets has really changed massively uh, in the last 30 years. So this event, both today, this afternoon, and tomorrow's full day, and the dinner tonight, is to recognise outstanding contribution to global capital markets in regulation and design. I'd like to also uh, welcome our keynote speaker tonight, who we're very fortunate to have, is Dr. Morris Newman. Uh, Morris is extremely well known and very eminent in industry. Uh, among other things, uh, Morris was the former chairman of Deutsche Bank Australia and New Zealand, uh, former chairman of the ASX, and a uh, former chairman of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and a former chancellor of Macquarie University. His career spans over 50 years in stockbroking and investment banking. He's chaired a number of Asian business alliances and has been advisor to Australian governments, both state and federal. Uh, Dr Newman currently is uh, Tony Abbott, the Prime Minister's Business Advisory Council Chairman, uh, and uh, he has a number of other directorships that he holds and has held in his uh, eminent career. Dr Newman uh, was appointed as an Honorary Professor in Public Diplomacy at the Soft Power Advocacy and Research Centre, Macquarie University, in September 2012. Um, Dr. Dr. Newman will be speaking uh, an address um, and uh, he's available for uh, some questions, a question time uh, after his speech. Um, but before we get to, uh, to welcoming Dr. Newman, um, CIFA is very, very thankful for the opportunity that the federal and the New South Wales state governments has provided us in not only funding tonight, but funding the last three and a half years. And CIFA's mission ultimately is to engage academics and scholars, to engage the public policy aspects of financial regulation, both domestically and internationally. And we have uh, been very fortunate to have invested about $18.5 million of, uh, of government money into research. We have funded 70 research projects. Uh, there are multiple outputs with those 70 projects and uh, we're in an exponential sort of output phase of, uh, of contributing thought leadership and policy uh, to Australia and internationally. I'd also like to, uh, to also thank uh, one of our, our board members, Steve Harker, uh, who represents New South Wales government. Also a personal message from our chairman, Peter Mason, who can't be with us tonight, uh, traveling overseas. Uh, he uh, is very supportive of this event. He's been very supportive as chairman of CIFA and uh, he passes on his personal regards to members tonight. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, as been mentioned, ASX tonight, UBS sponsoring tomorrow, um, University of Sydney Capital Markets CRC, uh, and obviously the federal and New South Wales state governments. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in welcoming Morris Newman. I think you've got my... It does help. Uh, I could be here or we could be here till about midnight if I didn't have my, my notes. But David, thank you very much for your generous introduction and uh, uh, good evening to everybody. It's uh, uh, in, a, in a conference dealing with financial regulation, uh, it's something that I never really thought you could make enjoyable. But uh, we'll, somebody, uh, Mike Aitken, was actually asking to make it controversial, but I said if, uh, that's entirely up to you as to whether or not you think it's controversial. But uh, f uh, principally what I want to deal with is 
where the world is going in relation to regulation. And I was reminded I was a guest uh, of the Bao Conference in Hainan, China, Hainan Island. <clears throat> it's held annually at the end of March, and it's a grand affair. It's really the Chinese, uh, it's their answer to the World Economic Forum at Davos. Uh, it's held in the expansive resort on, of uh, Bao, <clears throat> and uh, it draws essentially the same sort of people as go to Davos. When I was a Deutsche, I used to be a reasonably regular attendee at, at, at Davos. So uh, it, it draws the same sort of people, but it's got a very different look and feel, and it's got nothing whatever to do with the climate. Obviously, uh, Davos is in the middle of winter. Uh, the uh, climate in, in, uh, in Bao is, is always subtropical. But it's more that, unlike the, the uh, Davos conference, <coughs> which is Eurocentric, tends to lean to the left, and favours harmonised global solutions to virtually everything, Bao concentrates on infrastructure, trade liberalisation, energy and resources, uh, and it doesn't do what uh, the people in Davos uh, spend their time talking about, which is worrying about wellness, uh, inequality, gender gaps and climate change, all of which are important but tend to be really uh, the pre preoccupation of comfortable elites. Now given the West's traditional free market heritage and China's communist roots, the contrast in social and economic policy directions couldn't really be more stark. And while the Chinese are single-minded in their pursuit of market solutions, personal responsibility, self-reliance and wealth creation, the, wealth is the, the Western world is obsessed with uh, big government, wealth redistribution, middle-class welfare and capital misallocation. At the third party plenum meeting, which was held in November of 2013, the Chinese leadership announced a new magnificent revolution which pledged that the market and the price mechanism will have primary responsibility for economic decisions and resource allocation, not the state. Now the reform manifesto ordered state-owned enterprises to embrace competition, become more efficient and transparent and to consider mixed ownership. Anticipating the potential for corruption during the transition process, President Xi Jinping promised to come down hard on what he called tigers and flies, uh, and by all account, he's doing that. The manifesto builds on the 1978 reforms of Deng Xiaoping, and it promises to apply pure capitalist principles to an obsolete centrally planned economy. But having said that, Deng's socialist market economy produced miraculous results, something like 300 million people uh, or fewer people live in poverty than they did less than 40 years ago. Uh, the uh, grain production in China has improved by 70%, 70%. And China's share of world GDP has grown from 1.8% some 30 odd years ago to 6% today, when of course the world's GDP is a much bigger cake. But as impressive as this progress has been, growth is slowing. And the leadership has recognised that to ensure faster, more equitable and sustainable growth, the system must be even more capitalist. Now, currently, China is beset with issues. There are serious problems with air pollution and water quality. More than 16% of China's soil is polluted. Its local government and shadow banks are in poor shape. Debt to GDP is has grown to Japanese proportions. Wages have soared and eroded a lot of competitiveness. And there are signs of overinvestment in real estate and in the stock market. After a sudden 30% collapse left millions of investors in shock, the Chinese equivalent of the US plunge protection scheme, or team, uh, came in and uh, the Securities Regulatory Commission, which looked after this, raised $19.3 billion to try and stabilise the market and help find a bottom. 
Now, short selling curbs were put in place, and the Chinese People's Daily uh, reassured battered investors that it's after storms that we discover rainbows. Uh, I love the Chinese have a wonderful way with, with words. But still, traders have uh, been given in conflicting signals. Clearly, there was an expectation that the bottom had been reached and then the market fell again. But in time, like all markets, a base will be formed and like traders everywhere, the shorters will be punished, not necessarily by regulators, but by market forces, which will overwhelm them. Uh, for those learning to swim, this is the deep end of the swimming pool. Now, financial market collapses are a relatively new phenomenon for a political system more at home with issuing commands and receiving verdicts. But it will be a testing ground for the authorities as their fears of central planning impotence collide with the invisible hands of markets. Still, China has a massive and growing savings pool which is not being efficiently mobilised. There is too much reliance on bank credit, which up until now they've had uh, no bankruptcy laws. Governance and accounting standards are still de developing and the leadership balks at fully opening up its markets to the outside world. It persists with Deng's policy of hide your strengths and bide your time. However, when your economy is in purchasing power parity terms has overtaken the United States and is growing at better than 7% uh, annually, when your population is 1.3 billion people, and when the combined capitalization of the Shanghai and Shenzhen stock markets is around $9.5 trillion, making China the second largest market in the world, <clears throat> you'd have to say that the time for hiding is over. Now, so far, Hong Kong has successfully operated as a bridge between China and the outside world. Indeed, this is not only from a market access standpoint, but also in bringing outside sensitivity to China's regulatory needs. Yet this is a temporary measure. Beijing cannot forever avoid the loosening of capital controls and the opening up of its financial markets. Now, until relatively recently, Beijing has been suspicious of capital markets, seeing them as necessary evils which must serve the real economy. However, this is also changing as the sheer size of the mainland savings pool on the way to becoming the world's largest becomes a fully fledged and integrated sector on its own. Now, aware of this, the leadership has stepped up the pace of financial reforms. These have included the gradual internationalisation of the renminbi, the expansion of access to mainland markets, the relaxation uh, of interest rate controls, the streamlining of the IPO regime to make it easier for deserving enterprises to access capital, and the creation of new investment products and distribution channels. The speed of, rep uh, of reform can be expected to accelerate. China's $3 trillion in foreign exchange reserves, 80% of which have been invested in the United States, are the world's largest. And as well as the United States, these reserves are being invested in places as disparate as Sri Lanka and Australia. And they are being increasingly characterised as Chinese colonisation by stealth. But China shouldn't be blamed for the shortcomings of others. Its success is built on the Confucian culture of hard work, thrift, self-reliance and a more market-oriented society. And that means, like it or not, it has am amassed and continues to amass enormous wealth. And not surprisingly, with this wealth goes international influence. Already, in, uh, already awareness of this, uh, of this uh, amount of money uh, and, the, and that the world's capital centre is shifting from the traditional West to the rising East, it begins to beg questions about the intermediate uh, future of institutions like the IMF and the World Bank because the Chinese are looking to their own institutions. An inseparable aspect of China's financial strength is its strategic One Belt, One Road initiative which seeks to assemble countries along the old, uh, the old uh, Silk Road and they're looking to include 
uh, India in that as well. Now make no mistake, this is a serious proposal and will ultimately extend to Africa and parts of South America. Its purpose is to create an efficient, streamlined trading block where bureaucracy is minimised and where capital goods and services flow according to the most efficient criteria established by free market forces. The new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is part of that vision. It has been established to initially support infrastructure, con infrastructure construction in the Asia-Pacific region, but it will expand. The significance of Asia's rise and rise, while referred to in headlines, to me seems to be generally underestimated when compared to the recent pedestrian progress of the West. If you look at it through that prism, it is spectacular. Should India join APEC, which seems highly likely, it will be another reminder of how the locus of decision making is relentlessly moving east. No doubt not wanting to add momentum to this trend um, is perhaps the reason why the Americans have decided to shun membership of the AIIB. And also I think it probably reflects the reason why US Treasury Secretary Jack Lew uh, is undeterred by China's needs and is upping his call for more harmony in global regulations. Yet he must know that this is quite unrealistic. China has quite different priorities. Uh, it knows one size doesn't fit all and it won't accept that the West knows best. Uh, it's suspicious of Western motives. When I was in Bao, there was a very senior Chinese business person um, who said to me, why was Beijing always under pressure to adopt failed Western policies? I thought that was a very good question and I struggled to provide him with an answer. I think his view was that this was a conspiracy in the West to undermine China's progress. But I don't think it's sophisticated as that. I think that uh, we just think everybody should have the same regulations. Now, this doesn't mean that Beijing's reform agenda will ignore sensible Western developments. It has no appetite for a regu regulatory race to the bottom. Uh, China, to quote Deng Xiaoping, uh, intends to cross the river by feeling its way over the stones. Another wonderful Chinese um, uh, quotation. But few financial markets, uh, including equity commodity markets, foreign exchange, interest rate markets, none of them have really escaped damage to their reputation. And we've seen high profile abuses, manipulations, insider trading, Ponzi schemes, clients deliberately misled and collusion. So investors have suffered extraordinary losses and the primary function of markets to establish reliable signals for pricing risk has been seriously compromised. So whatever we think about China's shortcomings, they are not alone. And while Jack Liu's uh, legal training may lead him to yearn for global regulatory symmetry, there's no reason to believe a more internationally integrated China would fare any better. Indeed, if you think back Sarbanes-Oxley, which actually has investor protection in its name, uh, seems to have been powerless to prevent the global financial crisis. Uh, rather, uh, you, you might think that uh, if you look at the, the remedies which are being put forward by Mr Liu and his uh, central banker and market regulator friends, that they have created a potentially more dangerous problem for the future. And aside from introducing extraordinary moral hazards like too big to fail her hyperbole and unprecedented liquidity injections of something like $9 trillion since 2009, what they've been doing is encourage rampant speculation and bubbles. And the resultant asset misallocation and market distortions, I believe, will face a day of reckoning. Now at the micro level too, it can be argued that regulators have been complicit in encouraging high frequency trading, which in turn has fragmented central markets, added to volatility and increased the costs of access. The Chinese are not oblivious 
to the inadequacies of the international securities regulations. They think global and act local. Uh, they think global and they act local. And while China has a vested interest in high standards of regulation and governance, it sees no benefit in international collaboration, which is inappropriate for them or simply yields diminishing returns. China is pragmatic and it understands the trade-off between market efficiency and the costs associated with compliance. And while the latest stock market instability may slow its financial market liberalisation, it certainly won't derail it. And whatever the leadership's instincts, the China Silk Road ambitions demand that it continues to free up its markets. Now what China must grasp, however, is that for all the concentration on product innovation and technology, trust remains the critical constant. Legislation may seek to govern the conduct and behaviour of individuals and markets, but ultimately trust comes from an ethical culture which treats, uh, which treats clients equally and puts their interests first. Loss of trust can quickly undermine confidence in markets and prove uh, costly to businesses and also to economies. And trust may well be intangible, but the demise of Arthur Anderson stands as a real uh, demonstration of when the way in which when, dem when uh, reputations are lost, uh, it's often that they cannot be restored. So today China has an opportunity to build an image of running sensibly regulated, transparent and fair markets. But they don't have a long financial services history, let alone one supported by an ethical framework. From time to time, excesses have surfaced which suggest the Wild West rules rather than sensible supervision. An internationally acceptable code of conduct will take time for them to develop. And until it does, investors would be wise to adopt a caveat emptor approach. But that said, traditional ethical values, as I've been saying, uh, have been conspicuously absent in the West. Regulators have tried to fill the gap with prescriptive legislation, uh, and they've been piling prescriptive legislation on top of prescriptive legislation. Principle barely applies anymore. And this often suits clever wrongdoers because uh, they look for loopholes in the law. With a lapsed code of conduct, diminished peer group pressure, and a what's not illegal is legal uh, mindset, gamers can exploit the law to their advantage and they can avoid prosecution. This inevitably results in regulators playing catch up. New laws follow, but by then the carpetbaggers have moved on. The growing evidence from this regulatory creep is diminishing returns for regulators and taxpayers, demotivated entrepreneurs, increased market volatility and higher transaction costs. I think we're at that point. Today's capital and financial markets are the most regulated in history, yet the losses incurred by investors through the ethical uh, and criminal abuse of market users, the unethical and criminal abuse of market users, has never been greater. Lawmakers seem unmoved. Uh, they seem to keep wanting to regulate more. So as China feels its way over the stones, it will choose a path which is appropriate for it, for it at its level of development and for its Asian neighbours. Global investors will have to decide what level of re regulatory protection is critical for them and the appropriate pre premium, if any, uh, to apply to lighter touch regimes. Uh, Issuers will also have to weigh the benefits of, us, of accessing these huge uh, savings pools and the cheaper, less onerous uh, reporting requirements with investor attitudes and the possible premiums which will apply to accessing those markets. It seems to me this will be the future. There's the Western appetite for a more complex and demanding uh, regulatory regime, which would be globally based. Uh, and the Chinese approach, which uh, will be, be challenging the West's, uh, the West's attitude. <clears throat> the West will, of course, seek to characterise China as rejecting best practice, and they'll impugn China's market integrity. But I think it's pretty clear that the Chinese will stick to what they think is right for themselves and right for Asia at this time. 
Now, whether the West will continue to push for a single global standard or accept a compromise, only time will tell. But some competitive tension in the regulatory space, I think, is inevitable. And in fact, I think it's certain. And it, my view on that is it can only be not only for the benefit of China, but for the be benefit of all of us. Thank you. something really quite different to the rest of the world. Uh, these things are not what's going on, not only in China, but the rest of the world. What do you think about these sort of changes in, uh, should, is, this, is what we're doing the right thing or not? Well, I, my answer to that broadly is that what we want in Australia and what the world needs is uh, are more efficient markets. <clears throat> the more regulations, uh, the, the greater the cost of supervision of these markets, then clearly the, the cost of access uh, is increased. The amount of activity in those markets then tends to decrease, which leads to greater volatility and greater risk. Um, so to the extent that Australia is out of step with the West, rest of the world, unless there's compelling reason as to why the information they're seeking is going to be to the benefit of the whole market and that uh, somehow or other the market will be uh, improved by way of efficiency, uh, it would seem this is just another impost for people who access the market uh, and will add to the cost and add to the other, the other uh, uh, negatives which I've described. Now, I'm not close enough to know exactly what these new moves will do but uh, what you're describing is it's, it's an impost which is not going to make the Australian markets uh, uh, more competitive with the rest of the world. And if that's the case, then I think that's a, a negative. Poising from the University of Sydney. Um, I understand you mentioned about the Chinese stock market in your speech just now, but I'm just wondering whether it's possible for you to elaborate a bit more of your view of the recent uh, rise and then fall of the Chinese stock market and also the actions taken by the government to rescue the, uh, the stock market. Because um, from, um, from Western uh, market perspective, some of the action may be a bit um, difficult to understand the in terms of the reasoning and the impact and, and maybe the consequence about the markets in terms of uh, market uh, investors' confidence that you mentioned before. So I'm wondering whether you can share with us some of your views on that. Thanks. Well, the China uh, Securities Regulatory Commission decided to do essentially what the United States did in 2008 and establish a plunge pr protection team to uh, support the market. Uh, they had initial success. They thought that the... Uh, <coughs> the job was done, and then the market had another plunge. But this is not unusual. Uh, it's unusual to the Chinese because they're not used to this. Um, and uh, clearly the market had become uh, uh, overextended. The margin trading, I think, uh, had been virtually unregulated. Um, it, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of opaque trading taking place. Uh, so they also imposed some short selling restrictions. Look, I don't, uh, I don't know that we should single the Chinese market out for special attention because, as I said, the, the, the West was going through these sorts of issues in 2008. I mean, it's very easy for us to uh, 
to be anxious now, but we forget that uh, we were looking at a collapse in the global banking system, and particularly in the US banking system. And what did we do, having spent uh, years and years telling people about our accounting standards uh, and uh, the US FASB standards, we decided that uh, we would suspend them. So banks would not have to bring to account bad or doubtful debts. Now, it seems to me you can't have it both ways. If you want markets that are going to be regulated and you believe the regulations that uh, are in place uh, bring about the, the, the proper regulation of the market, then you can't say, well, they're, they're the regulations we're going to have in the good times, and the bad times we're going to remove them. So I think this is part of the problem. I think that, the, as I was saying, we get this regulatory creep. Uh, we're into diminishing returns. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not unusual for uh, any government agency to want to expand and the way in which this happens in the regulatory, of the, the regulation of securities markets is, of course, bringing in more uh, regulations and employing more people and more inspectors, and so it goes on. But uh, the Chinese uh, are relatively young in their development, they're learning, um, and I don't say that in any sort of uh, superior sense, but uh, this is, is new for them. They've dealt with it... Uh, the best way they can, uh, and essentially have drawn on the experience from the West in order to assist in that. Now, I think markets should find their own level without plunge protection teams or anything else, but that doesn't seem to be the way of the world anymore. Um, and uh, so this is, this is what you get. But uh, the market clearly seems now to have found some sort of flaw, whether that's the ultimate flaw, we wait and see. But uh, as I said, it, it is a market which doesn't have the protection that uh, we're used to in the West, even if you think the, the protection we have here is, is overdone. Uh, therefore, you need to apply a more buyer beware approach. Okay. Thank you very much, Morris. Uh, very insightful comments. So please join me in thanking Morris Newman. Thank you.